Well, good morning. Hey, it is great to have the youth back. Uh, we miss you when you're out doing things like serving other people. Um, so it is really nice to have you guys here. My name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and it's my pleasure uh, to bring God's word to us this morning to share uh, what he says about who he is and what he's doing and then how we are called to respond to that. And, um, and it's a real pleasure to be able to dive into God's word together. I love that we ended the first part of our singing with that song. Because that song is a reminder that the resurrected, ascended Jesus isn't just hanging out in heaven watching college football. He's doing stuff. He's at work. I was a little concerned at the Oregon game yesterday that he was at work doing something other than watching Oregon, but, um, but it all worked out in the end. Um, what we're going to talk about this morning is about how the resurrected, ascended Savior is at work in us, in this group this morning. And I love the song that it repeated again and again, Your Name is Victory. Because that's going to be one of the foundational truths that we have to come away with from today's passage. If Jesus were not victorious, there is no guarantee that the work that he is doing, even as the risen and ascended Savior, is going to work out. But he is victorious, and it will work out. Speaking of working out, does this look familiar to any of you? Remember this, the Karate Kid? This is the original version of the Karate Kid, the good and correct and authorized version of the Karate Kid. Not the remake. Um, do you remember what's going on in this scene? Wax on, wax off. Exactly. Okay, now for those of you who are not familiar with the movie, first off, I'll pray for your soul. Um, but let me set the scene on here. Danielson, this high school student played by a 20-something-year-old Ralph Macchio, um, has been, has recently moved to California, and he is getting bullied by kids at school, being the new kid on the block, so to speak. And he tries to take on some of these bullies, and it does not go well for him. Well, it turns out that there is a janitor that lives close to him, Mr. Miyagi, who, along with being a janitor and somehow the collector of many expensive cars, um, is a martial arts expert. And so Mr. Miyagi reluctantly says to Daniel, I will take you on and I will teach you martial arts so that you can defend yourself against these bullies at school. So Daniel shows up at Mr. Miyagi's house expecting to learn how to punch, kick, and beat up bad guys. And Mr. Miyagi puts him to work doing household chores. First thing he does, I can't remember actually the order, but says, here's this giant deck that I, as a poor janitor, um, have built in the back of my house. Uh, I need you to sand the deck. And here's this giant wood privacy fence the next time that Daniel comes to his house. And your lesson today is you are going to paint the fence. And then Daniel shows up at his house for the third lesson. And Mr. Miyagi hands him this sponge and says, you are going to wax my cars, my many, many expensive cars that we have no idea how he can afford. And as you can imagine, at the end of this third lesson, Daniel's a little frustrated, right? He signed on to learn how to beat down bad guys. And what he's been is free labor. And so he confronts Mr. Miyagi, which is a bad idea when the guy's a martial arts specialist, confronts him and says, 
this is crazy. What are you doing? I didn't sign on for this. I'm out of here. At which point, do you remember what Mr. Miyagi starts doing? He starts throwing punches. And what Daniel figures out really quick is that what he was learning to do while he was waxing on and waxing off and painting the fence and sanding the deck was how to defend himself when someone started throwing punches. And this light bulb goes off. And he says, there really was a reason. There was a purpose behind this. And once Daniel understands the purpose, once it clicks for him, Daniel is all in. There is a lot of times in life where what we think that God has asked us to do is sand the deck paint the fence, and wax the car. God, you've got me in a job that I cannot stand and I can barely pay the bills. It feels like all I am doing is sanding the deck and there is no good reason. God, I am stuck, friendless, not in relationship. I am lonely and alone and it feels like all you're doing is asking me to paint the fence day after day, week after week, and I don't see any reason behind this whatsoever. God, I've been dealing with this physical ailment and I am in pain every single day and there is no relief and it feels like all you're asking me to do is wax the car. And in the midst of all of that, you're asking me to live a completely different life from everyone else in our culture. You're asking me to stay pure. You're asking me to give financially. You're asking me to put others ahead of myself and I don't see the purpose that you have for me. And our passage this morning in Ephesians 4 is God answering the question and reassuring that there is a purpose. There is a purpose that transcends our circumstances. There is a purpose that transcends any particular moment in time that we find ourselves. But if we're really going to get what Paul is doing in Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 16, it's helpful as we do each week to go back and remember what is going on in the entire book of Ephesians. Now, remember, the Ephesus, the city where this was written to, was a very important regional port city in the Roman Empire. We said the equivalent might be something like a Houston. It was an important financial area. It was an important area of trade. It was a place that was generally considered very wealthy. It's an entertainment area. And it was also a very important area for pagan worship. And we looked at this, um, we looked at these pictures a couple of weeks ago. This is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is the temple to Artemis that was built and existed in Ephesus at the time that Paul was, was writing this. It was about one and a half times longer than a football field. It was about 70 times wider than a football field. It had 127 columns. Each of them were 60 feet high. There was incredible artwork all throughout this. And there was something else in there that we haven't talked about yet. Something that looks like this. This is actually... Let's just say that the goddess Artemis subcontracted or subleased her temple, or at least part of it, to this goddess. There was a section in that temple that was dedicated to the goddess, and people debate on how you say the name. Hel we'll say Helcate. She was the goddess of the underworld of witchcraft and sorcery. And the common belief that existed amongst the Ephesians at that time was that if you wanted protection from evil, especially evil spirits, what you had to do was you had to appease this goddess. And if you didn't do that, then you were at risk of being at the whims of the evil forces that would come out of the underworld. And so Paul is writing to a culture that is extremely wealthy, it's extremely comfortable, and it is extremely spiritually misguided. And do you think he has anything to say to us today? 
Because it sounds a lot like our culture. And the questions that he is answering in the book of Ephesians is how do you, as a small minority, a small church, a group of cultural outsiders, how do you thrive in a society like this? And how do you advance the gospel in a society like this? And you know what's remarkable? as we've seen as we go through the book of Ephesians, is that Paul's strategy is not do door-to-door evangelism. Nothing wrong with that. Paul's strategy is not have giant crusades. Nothing wrong with that. Paul's strategy is that if you want to thrive in the midst of a godless culture, if you want to advance the gospel in the midst of a godless culture, The core fundamental strategy as you as a community of believers must be united. That sounds so incredibly inward focused, but that is the strategy that's laid out in the book of Ephesians. And so as we've gone through Ephesians, we've noticed that the book is divided into two halves. The first half is all about what God has done. He has revealed himself. He has revealed the gospel. He has taken people who are spiritually dead and made them alive. He's taken people who are distant from God and God's people and brought them into God's family. And Paul prays twice in those first three, verse, first three chapters that the people would know God intimately and be strengthened and changed because of their intimate knowledge of who God is. And now as we move into chapter 4, we're in the second half of the book. And this is all about what the Ephesians are to do. And last week we saw the first six verses of the book of of chapter 4 of Ephesians are all about how that unity that Paul is talking about, that unity that God has given us, ultimately The first step in preserving that unity is the change that's got to take place in our hearts. And remember, he identified five different virtues. Humility, gentleness, patience, the willingness to bear with one another, and then the eagerness, the desire to run after, to pursue after, to fight for, maintaining the unity that God has given us. And we said that basically what that was saying is that unity is an inside job. It starts from the inside of us and works out. And today's passage is going to turn that around. And it's going to say that if you want those five qualities, if you want to be like Christ, that is an outside job. It is a job that works as the Holy Spirit uses the people around us, the people in this church to challenge us, to grow us, to help us develop those characters that we, that character traits that we may be united with one another. And Paul is going to unravel this in today's passage by identifying two different gifts that Jesus gives. First is the gift of grace Second is the gift of people. And then the third thing Paul is going to do is he's going to close out this passage by saying, here's the purpose. Here is how those gifts are supposed to be used. But the first thing he identifies is what he calls the gift of grace. And I say that, and I want to note, I want to highlight, if I can get this to work, that he starts the passage with the word but. It's a contrast. Remember what Paul had just said in verses 1 through 6. Paul had said we are united together. He used the word one seven different times in those six verses to emphasize that we are one. We share one gospel. We have one faith. We serve one Lord. We have one Savior. Again and again, he's emphasizing that we are one. And then he gets to verse 7 and he says, but contrast there is something also that is different just because we are united doesn't mean we are the same unity is not uniformity and the point of verses 7 through 10 is that the victorious Jesus the victorious king the victorious warrior gives each of us, every one of us, gifts, and those gifts, as we're going to see, are distinct. Now, what are those gifts? It's interesting, he calls them grace, but grace was given to each one of you. Now, the word, really, it should be translated, but the grace, 
was given to each one of you. That sounds weird, but that's exactly how it's written in the Greek. There's a little article there. Why does he say it that way? Well, he says it that way to point out that he's not talking about just grace in some general random way. He's talking about something very specific, a specific aspect of grace. And I think in the context, what we're going to see is that it's an empowerment for ministry. We know in other passages, he talks about spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives that empowers us to minister to one another. But I think in this context, although it includes that, it means so much more. It's the resources that we have graciously received from God. It's the talents. It's the personality that we've graciously received from God. And he is saying each individual has received different gifts that you can use. We saw this in work this past week here at FBC. Right Over the last few weeks, we have been collecting gifts that we could send to our missionaries so that their kids can enjoy these gifts as a part of their Christmas celebration. Now, if you were over here, if you were here at the church on Thursday, you would have seen a remarkable thing taking place. At least it's remarkable to me. We had a whole bunch of women here who know how to wrap gifts. That is remarkable because if you were to see me try to wrap gifts, you would figure out very quickly, this is a gift that some people have and some people don't. Now, it sounds like a silly thing. But the fact that we had people here who were looking at, I don't know, basketballs and trying to figure out how you wrap that and make that presentable to a kid so they enjoy opening it. We had someone who had like its Tinkerbell costume and these wings are out there. It's like, I got to figure out how to wrap this and pack this. And I mean, it's such a small thing. But this is an example of these are gifts that people have been given that they were using to share God's love in a tangible way. Now, it's important to notice in answering the question of who gets them that each one of us gets them. Every single person has gifts that they have been graciously given by God that they can use to minister to others. There is not a single person who is sitting in this room. I don't care what you think about your talent level. I don't care what you think about your capabilities. I don't care what you think about your past. Every one of you, if you are a follower of Jesus, have been given gifts that you can use to minister to others. And then there's a question of why. Why did he give us these gifts? According to the measure of Christ's gifts. What it's saying here is that Jesus has a plan. The gifts were given to you not based on your merit, they are the unfolding of his plan for history, and he has given you a part in that plan, and he has empowered you to play a part. And I would even go a step further. I think part of what he's saying when he emphasizes grace is that not only are the gifts that he's given you an act of grace, but it is his grace that works through you as you minister to make that ministry effective. It is all according to God's plan that is unfolding in Christ. And then Paul supports what he's saying in verse 7 by quoting from Psalm 68. And that's what you've got in verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. That is a really interesting statement. See, here's what's going on in Psalm 68. In Psalm 68, God is presented as a divine warrior. And this divine warrior conquers all of his enemies. And then he takes his enemies captive and he leads them to the throne. And at the throne, it says in Psalm 68, those men give gifts to God. But do you see that Paul changed it here? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What Paul does is he emphasizes to these listeners, to these readers, it's not just about God receiving gifts. God, the divine warrior, the conqueror, is the giver of gifts, not just the recipient of gifts. God, the divine warrior, just like it talks about in Psalm 68, has defeated every foe that stands against him, and he can lead them to his throne, but then he doesn't just receive gifts. He turns 
and he gives gifts to men. And then Paul picks up on this word ascended, and he uses it to explain the vastness, the completeness of the victory that is experienced by this divine warrior. It is a victory in every realm. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions. Now, do you see how the ESV explains what the lower regions are? It says the earth. If you were to read this in Greek, what it would say is he descended to the lower regions of the earth. To a first, now he may very well be talking about Jesus descending to earth in his incarnation. But to the first century reader, when they hear lower, re, lower regions, you know what comes to mind? Remember that goddess Helkate? That's what they would have thought of. Jesus descended to the realm of even where spiritual evil, darkness, and death, where all of that reigns supreme, where all of that is, ex where all of that is controlled, and Jesus descends there, and he is victorious. And not only is he victorious, unlike anyone else who would enter into that realm, he does not have to stay. He who descended is the one who also ascended. In other words, what Paul is saying here is that there is not any realm of existence, physical or spiritual, even the most terrifying things to the first century uh, Ephesian, the elements in the areas of spiritual darkness, there is no area where Jesus has not conquered. There is no place that Jesus does not reign. There is no place where he is incapable of carrying out his plan. See, the point that Paul makes in verses 7 through 10 is that Jesus has graciously given a role for every Christian in his plans, and he has given every Christian the tools to carry out that role. And then in verses Seven, verses 8 through 10, he emphasizes, and there is nothing, nothing that can prevent him from carrying out that plan and working through. I want you to stop and think about the implications of that for a second. In your mind, I'd like you to think of, please don't name this person out loud. Please don't. Name one Christian in your mind for whom God's grace is not working through them to impact other people. One person. Trick question. Because the answer is no one. The answer is no one. One of the most dangerous lies that we believe is that our usefulness to God depends on our circumstances and our capabilities. And that is a lie because our usefulness to God depends on his grace in your life and Jesus' ability to execute his plan. The smallest child that you know who is a follower of Christ is someone in whom and through whom God is working to minister to other people. If you know someone who no longer has the strength to do the things that they used to do. They're getting older. Their body is breaking down. Guess what? That person is a person in whom and through whom God's grace is working to impact other people. If we really believe, if we really believe that our ability to impact other people is not based on our capabilities, but on God's capabilities and Jesus' capabilities to execute his plan. Guess what? The person who is bedridden with Alzheimer's and dementia and cannot even recognize the person around him, that person God is working through graciously to impact others. I cannot tell you how in most cases. But if it's not up to our capabilities, then there will never ever be a moment in your life that God is not working in you and through you to impact other people. Does that make sense?
when someone raises the question of what value does that person have, look at their condition they are in. They betray an assumption that that person's value and usefulness depends on what they are capable of doing. And I want to reassure everyone in this room, because if you don't have family members who are going through this, you will. The value of that person has nothing to do with their capabilities. The impact of that person has nothing to do with their capabilities. It has to do with God's capabilities and his grace working through that person. We must give up the notion that our effectiveness and our value to God and others has anything to do with our own capabilities. God's gift of grace to you includes that he has an assignment for you. And he will work through that assignment and empower you to execute that assignment. The second gift that he gives is a gift of people. And there are people to help you carry out that assignment. And that's what's going on in verses 11 and 12. He lists these five different groups of people and identifies them not as a complete and exhaustive list of gifts or people that he's given, but these are, these are people who were given the responsibility to prepare people to plant God's churches, to help develop God's churches, and prepare people to minister to one another. Let me just walk you through quickly what I think is going on here. Apostles refer to people who are sent. And I think here he's referring to more than just the original 12 and to Paul. I think he is referring to the people who at that time were sent out and to go places where the gospel had never been preached. And they planted churches and they grew communities of believers. And today we call those people missionaries, church planters, right? We heard from one this morning, the farmers. And if you can read my writing, you get extra credit. Who are the prophets? That's an interesting word. Well, in 1 Corinthians, Paul explains that prophets are people who strengthen, encourage, and comfort believers. We have ministry leaders who provide different forms of pastoral care, in churches. We have people like Ken Fairweather who sits with people in the Encore group and helps them understand how do you how do you apply God's word to what you're going through in life? We have people like Jordan Johnson who sit with students and their families in our church and say, let me comfort you and encourage you and strengthen you as you think through what it means to be a teenager in this society and to follow Christ. Now, if apostles were the ones out there planting churches and sharing the gospel in new places, evangelists were people that were sharing the gospel, continued to share the gospel where a church was already planted. A lot of churches have outreach staff that is designed exactly to do that. These are people who are designed to look in the community and say, how do we impact our community? Right, we are, I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight this. I'm doing this in part, or I'm doing this for a reason. We are so blessed as a community to have Moberly Baptist Church in this community, right? One of the reasons we're blessed is one of their pastors is here just to encourage us this morning. That means a lot. But one of the things that they have done is they've recognized we've got the resources to have a staff that can look around and say, where is there a need in the community? And so they start something like Hope Road Counseling that provides biblical, Christ-centered counseling to people in this community who might otherwise never walk through the door of a church. But in this context, they are encountering God's word and the gospel in a way that impacts their lives. Shepherds and teachers. It's interesting how he writes this. He writes it differently from the rest of the list. And it's because he's wanting us to make the, I make the connection that these two things, shepherd and teacher, go hand in hand. 
even though they're different roles. The word that translated shepherd is the word from which we get the word pastor. This is the only time it's used in the New Testament to apply to a church leader, which is interesting. Um, the idea of a shepherd is someone who would use their gifts, their strength, their position to guide, to protect, to lead, to care for the flock. And a teacher is someone who explains God's word and exhorts people to live by faith. That's your pastoral staff. Now here is where things get radically countercultural. Here is where we are about to get very, very, well, I'm not going to get uncomfortable. You're going to get uncomfortable. Um, because verse 12 is going to explain why he gave these people. And he gave these people to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The reason Jesus gave these people to the church is to equip them to do the work of ministry. Jesus did not give these people to the church to do ministry for the church while the church body passively receives. Jesus gave these people to prepare each member to actively serve in the ways that God has gifted them. And if you approach church with the mindset of what do you have to give me, you're starting from the wrong place. You need to start with the question, how is God equipping me through the church to minister to others? Look at it the other way around. If someone comes to a staff member and says, I have a friend that God is clearly working in their lives. Could you meet with them and share the gospel? Do you want to know what the right response for that staff member is? No. Let me teach you how to share the gospel. In general, there are many exceptions to that. If someone comes up to a staff member and says, I've got this person who, who really need, is struggling. They need to be comforted and encouraged. Could you meet with them and just kind of lift their spirits? In general, the right answer from that staff member would be no. Let me help you meet with this person. God has put them on your heart. Let me teach you how to encourage them and support them and walk through whatever they are going through. And that is countercultural because we tend to see churches as providers of services, not places where we train. We tend to think of churches in the same way that we think of law firms. When my mother died a few years ago, we found a law firm that had someone in that law firm that specialized in estates. And that person helped us Walk through everything you got to walk through when you're settling someone's estate. Well, our family's in a different situation now. We have, long story, extended family owns part of downtown Los Angeles. We are selling that. Very complicated. So guess what? We went to a different law firm. And we found someone in that firm who specializes in selling commercial real estate in downtown Los Angeles. Now, I can assure you, I can absolutely promise you, if either one of these attorneys had turned to our family and said, guess what? I'm not going to do this for you. I'm going to teach you how to do this. Uh, we would have said, no, that's not why we're paying you the money. We'll go find someone else. And that's exactly what we do to churches. We walk in there and we say, I want you to give me this service. Isn't that why I pay you? Why do churches, all churches, trust me, this is universal. Why do churches have such a problem 
getting people to volunteer. Why? Because deep down, we struggle with the belief that the point of church is to give me spiritual services. When in reality, the point of church is to grow us, to build us, to equip us that we might minister to one another. Paul says that we must understand that we have been graciously gifted to impact one another. And he has given us the people in the church to help us deploy those gifts, to grow in using those gifts, to help us know how to impact people. And then Paul ends the passage by identifying three purposes that our ministry with one another is supposed to have. And the very first purpose is in verse 13. The first purpose is we are to grow in our knowledge of Christ and Christ-likeness. We are to grow in our knowledge of the Son of God. And remember, when we talk about knowledge in Scripture, we're not talking about the accumulation of data. We're not talking about facts. We are talking about experientially knowing who Jesus is, knowing how he works in our lives, and that leads to maturity. And how is maturity measured? It's not, again, measured by how many Bible verses we know or how often we go to church. It is measured by becoming more and more like Christ. The motto of FBC is experiencing Jesus transforming lives. Why is that our motto? Because as we experience Jesus, we become more and more aware that he is at work in our lives, and our lives become more and more transformed. When we go through the horrible times of life, or the great times of life, or frankly just the routine times of life, we discover if we are paying attention that Jesus is at work in those moments to shape what is our definition of success? What is it that we value? How do we think? How do we relate to one another? How does our character respond to the world? around us. Jesus, at every moment, including this moment right now, is at work in you to shape you to be more like Christ. And the question is, are you paying attention enough to know the Son of God at that level? Verse 13 is essentially saying, help people know Christ. That's the goal. Help them see how Christ is at work in their lives so they will grow. The second purpose is in verse 14, and it's to help us to avoid dangerous and deceitful teaching. Children is not used in a positive way here. It's used to emphasize one of my favorite pastimes. Children are easy to deceive. Anyone else enjoy that game? I had a whole group of children one time believing that the U.S. Navy conducted submarine exercises in a local lake. There is just nothing like that. It's the reason that my kids do not let me hang out with my grandkids. Paul's point here is that the spiritually young, the spiritually immature, are easy to deceive. And haven't we seen that in our own lives? Here's one of my all-time favorites. I got a call from a family member one time explaining to me why it is that when Jesus returns, it will be in the United States. Because a television preacher had convinced her that since USA is in the middle of the word Jerusalem, that when Jesus returns, he is going to return to the USA. That is a true story. It's silly. But some of the other ones aren't so silly. I can remember a man standing in the lobby of this church telling me this Christianity thing isn't working out for me. See, what he had been led to believe was if he came to Christ, it was going to fix his relationship with his girlfriend. If he came to Christ, 
It was going to fix his financial situation, and it was going to make his job better. And none of those things were happening. And in fact, those were absolutely inappropriate promises to make. That is not what God is doing in people's lives. But because he had received false doctrine, he ended up walking away from Christ. I have a very good friend who lives in Dallas. They struggle financially, her and her husband. And every time that something happens to them that really hits them hard, the question that they ask again and again is, what did I do to make God mad? They view financial struggle as a declaration of God's judgment on them. What a horrible picture of God. What a horrible, horrible picture of who God is. And so they live their lives every day trying to figure out, how do I appease this God so that he will take care of me financially? That sounds a lot more like the paganisms of the Ephesians than it does like the God of the Bible. What is Paul saying here? We must, as we minister to one another, prayerfully remind people of what is true about God, what is true about ourselves, what is true about the people that we are around. We must constantly remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel. The final goal is in verses 15 and 16, and that is that we are to develop maturity in Christ. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. And how do we do it? One of the great verses ripped out of context and completely misunderstood is we must speak the truth in love. What we tend to say that that verse means is that I'm going to tell you things that you don't want to hear, but I'm going to have a tear in my eye while I do it. Do you see what the context is? The context is these are people who are a threat of having misunderstanding of who God is, of how God relates to them, how God loves them. What Paul is saying is we must speak the truth of the gospel to one another in love. We must remind one another that, yes, we are all broken fallen sinners. We are separated from God without Christ, but if you are a believer, you have Christ, and his death on the cross was sufficient to cover every one of your sins, past, present, and future, and he has now ascended, and he is now at work in your life, and the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work to transform you. That is the truth that we must speak to one another lovingly, patiently, seeking their good constantly picture that Paul has here is this dynamic image of the church, of each member of the body receiving nourishment from Christ, and they in turn serve other parts of the body with the strength and grace they have received from Christ. Paul's vision for the church is that each member will actively contribute to the growth of the body and facilitate its growth to maturity. The body cannot grow properly without all believers receiving gifted input from other believers in the body. You must, I must, we must use our God-given gifts to prayerfully speak God's word to one another. I have this conversation a lot. where Someone will come to me and say, I don't know what God wants me to do. Do I take this job? Do I not take this job? Do I leave school now? Do I stay in school? Do I pursue this friendship? Do I not pursue this friendship? And we'll talk through the details. But at some point, if I'm thinking clearly, I will take them back to, you know what? You actually do know what God wants you to do. You do. Because it doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter if you're in school or not. It doesn't matter what your circle of friends are. You have an assignment that transcends, that underlies every situation that you have that will never, ever change. Your fundamental assignment is to use what God has given you 
and to prayerfully speak the truth of God's word to those around you. And then to look to the church as a place that will help you do that more effectively. Growing in maturity is not something that a, purpose, a person accomplishes on their own. It requires all of us speaking God's truth into each other's lives. It requires all of us to use our gifts that God has given and then trust in his capability to work through us. And it requires a church that is committed to seeing each person grow in their ability to do what God has called them to do and then release them to do it. And that is exactly Paul's point in this message. Jesus made spiritual maturity a community project. It is not something that happens in isolation. It is something where you are required and we are required to speak into one another's lives. A lot gets clarified in life when we understand the fundamental assignment that God has for us. It doesn't matter where you work, where you go to school, your assignment is the same. Well, how do we respond to this? As usual, we have four different ways that we suggest a response. Rewrite the passage in your own words. I'm encouraging you to do that for every part of Ephesians that we study. I would love it if we get to the end of Ephesians that you have so deeply dived into this book that you have the entire book written out. Understanding, thinking through what is it. God has given each one of you resources and gifts, and he Someone in your life, I know this week, who needs to be blessed by what he has given you. Who is that person? And take a step and use your gifts to help that person grow. Speak the truth in love to someone this week. And what I don't mean is sit down and tell them something they don't want to hear with a tear in your eye. Someone in your life needs to be reminded of God's grace and love and mercy. And they can fully accept the fact that God sees them in all of their brokenness and he loves them. And pray that FBC and Moberly and New Beginnings and the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Longview and every church you can think of would be churches that see people grow in maturity. May we never settle for any other goal or vision. You're someone here who has not got a relationship with God. You're just starting out your spiritual journey. Here's what I challenge you with. Any purpose, other than the purpose we've identified here, that you have for your life is going to come and go based on the circumstances you're in. Would you come talk to someone at the end of the service? We'll have people up front track me down about a purpose that will never change. It will never go away. Maybe you're a brand new Christian and you want to understand how God has gifted you. What are these things that we're talking about and how do you use them? Again, come talk to any of us who are going to be up here and let us help you. And if you're a mature believer, then you've got to be looking around and asking the question, how do I deploy my gifts? Who is in my life that I need to speak God's truth? We're going to end by singing probably my favorite hymn of all time. We're going to sing about the unique wonder of who our God is by singing holy, holy, holy. And I want us to make the connection that this is the God who has called you into his work and has invited you to participate. Let's sing holy, holy, holy.
The truth of Ephesians 4 takes on a whole new magnitude when you set it next to the truth expressed in that hymn. There are creatures in heaven that if we saw a glimpse of them, they would terrify us to the point of death. And those creatures fall on their faces, bowing to our God. And that is the God who has looked at you and said, You have a place in my plan. You have an assignment. That is who our God is. And that is what he is calling you to. So our job as we leave here is to take up that assignment and say, allow me to speak God's word and God's truth to those around me that they may grow in Christ. You are dismissed. Prayer team, if you'd come forward, if you have anything that you'd like to pray for, please join us up front.